decided that over the next couple of months, we're going to dive into this concept of prayer. If you've spent enough time in church, maybe you've been in, your church, been in church all your life. Some of you, this could be your first time. Maybe some, some of you at home, this is your first time checking out church. But if you've spent enough time in church, you've heard about prayer. You've probably been encouraged to pray. Um, we recognize that so often the application we give is pray. I can remember a few months back, Pastor Brian had shared that as an application point, we'll go pray, and somebody in the church had come up to me and she said, you guys tell us all the time to pray, but you don't tell us how. It's always go pray, go pray, go pray, but how? When are you going to teach us how? And so that was sort of what spurred this, the idea for this series in my heart. Let's talk about how. Let's talk about how we pray and dive into that. And we're going to do that over the next couple of months. Because what I recognize is that we learn a lot of what we know about prayer from other people. We learn prayer from listening to other people, whether that was our parents or people we've been around. And, and sometimes we, we pick up things that are really weird and nuanced. It's interesting. I love the prayers of children because children are honest and real and their prayers are not, uh, they're not, tainted by our pious and flowery words that we tend to use. I can remember when my youngest son, at one point he was praying at the dinner table and he was thanking God for everything. And uh, that seems to be a pattern for children. They're very thankful when they pray to God. And he's, thank you God for mommy and daddy. And thank you God for our dog Ava. And thank you God for lizards. And thank you God for my cars. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. He went on. I'm thinking, how did lizards make the list? And where do I fall? as mommy, daddy, in comparison to lizards? Is it equal? Am I above lizards? I don't know. But it was just honest. It was real. And I think you find that in kids. But we grow and start hearing prayers and sometimes mimicking things in prayer that we don't actually know what we're saying or make any sense. You know, sometimes we get in patterns of prayer where we just say things over and over without really thinking about it. So, so, so often we maybe sit down to have a meal and we start a prayer, thank you God for this day, thank you for this food, and it's the same pattern every time. I, I encourage you to go ask Caleb a story about when he was told to call his grandmother and thank her for something she gave him, a gift or something, and he got the message machine, so when he called her, he started Thank you, God, for this food. I mean, thanks, Grandma, for the gift. It just gets so ingrained in us that we do it and not even thinking about it. I think about the comedian Tim Hawkins. He shared about things that we say that they don't make any sense. Like, we pray for a hedge of protection around people. What is a hedge of protection? And if you're going to pray for my protection, can you pray for more than a hedge? Like something that a pair of clippers couldn't get through or just brute force. Like what's a hedge of protection? Or we pray when we're praying for a meal, God bless the hands that prepared it. Like why just their hands? And what do blessed hands look like? And I'm not trying to mock anybody's prayers. I'm just saying there's things that we say that we don't think about. Sometimes we pray things like, God bless this food to my body. Which in essence, every time we pray that, for for a lot of us, the times we're praying that, we're actually asking God to do the miraculous. God, turn this Cheeto into a carrot stick on the way down. Bless this food to my body. It's, It's food that can't bless my body, but I pray that anyhow because it's my pattern. And I'm not saying anything against that. We should pray some of those things. But we should think about our prayers, where they come from. Why do we pray that that way? So if we learn prayer from other people. Why not learn prayers from the great men of faith throughout the Scripture? So this whole series, what we're going to do is we're going to dig into the the prayers of great men, Old Testament, New Testament. What did they pray? How did they pray? And what can we learn from them? And I recognize we could look at Jesus' disciples said to him, teach us to pray. And that would be the greatest place to start. But I recognize Jesus is still God. And so when he prays, there's a unique connection that he has with God. So I want to look at what did the guys who learned from Jesus do in their prayers? What did they talk about in their prayers? And in it, we can pray. We can can make requests of God. We're challenged in the Scripture to pray for somebody who's sick, to come before the elders and pray over those who are sick. Those are all things that we should do. But I wonder if our prayers could grow to be deeper than the laundry list of illnesses and the sort of callous, non-thinking terms that we throw out there and become real honest 
prayer. So this morning we're going to look at a person named Nehemiah and his prayer. And Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He was a strong leader. He became a strong leader for the nation of Israel during a time of turmoil in their life. I I think you can almost consider Nehemiah like a a Winston Churchill. He showed up when there was chaos in their society. There was chaos in their nation. He showed up and he provided solid leadership. And and Nehemiah was a, a, a man of great prayer. At the time... The, the nation uh, of Israel, was they were taken from their land, and they went into captivity. It's about 450 B.C. And throughout that time, different leaders or different world powers took control. So at this point in Nehemiah's life, the Persians are the world power. And the Persians had give, given some freedom to the Israelites to return to their land, to return to Jerusalem, to, be, to go back and rebuild. And there are a group of guys who come back to Nehemiah and he asks them, what's the report? What's happening in Jerusalem? Now Jerusalem is the the central city for the Israelites. It's the place of God's presence. It's the place of God's glory and their perception. So when they come back, they tell Nehemiah, they say the walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire, and the people are basically oppressed and struggling. And it says, Nehemiah responded to that. Here's his response. When I heard these things... I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. His response to the news wasn't, oh guys, sorry to hear that, I'll pray for you. His response was brokenness. He was broken in the news and he sat down and he wept over the state of his nation. He wept over the situation of his fellow brothers And it says he fasted, he put aside food for the sake of prayer, and he prayed for days. Day and night he prayed. And I'm led to believe, because when we're told when he gets the news, the month uh, that we're told is somewhere around November or December, it isn't until maybe four months later that he approaches the king to make his request to go back and rebuild. So perhaps for four months, Nehemiah prayed and wept and fasted for the brokenness of his city. And I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I struggle to pray for four minutes, let alone four months. So what we want to do in this series, you see in your seats, you have those cards. What we're going to do each week is we're asking that we as a church would pause every day and pray together. We're going to set it at noon Every day, I recognize that there's flexible schedules, different schedules, but our goal is to at least pause once a day and pray, and each day to pray about these things. And and what you'll see this week, we're going to pray over some of the stuff we're going to talk about this morning. But I just imagine what could happen if we as a church, every day together, collectively, wherever we are, stopped at our lunch break or stopped at the house and just said, "I'm I'm going to go before God and seek Him in prayer. Because... I don't want to equate us to the situation that they're in, but our nation feels broken. And perhaps your home right now feels broken, or your workplace feels broken. So what do we do? We pray. And the question, or maybe the thought that I want us to keep in mind is, let's pray like the walls are falling down. They may, they may not be. I'm not making any prophetic statement. I don't know what's happening. The walls may be falling down, they may not be, but what would it look like for us to pray like they were? To have the same heart and passion that Nehemiah had to say, we're going to pray like the walls are falling down. We're going to weep and be broken over what we see in our homes, in our community, in our nation, and around the world. And we get an idea of what that looks like because Nehemiah shows us his prayer. He prays like the walls are falling down, and he shows us what that prayer looks like. First, he reflected upon the character of God. It says this in, in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. He says, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love and keep his commandments. He starts by reflecting on God's character. By speaking of who God is. Not to remind God or to stroke God's ego, but to remind Himself. When everything feels like it's broken, we need to remind ourselves that God is not. He's still in control. He's still sovereign. He still is bigger than everything that we're facing. Prayer should be a reflection. That's a great place to start. To reflect upon who God is 
in the midst of what I see in my world. Because he's still at work. He says, God, you are the, the God of heaven. In a society in which many believe that there were certain gods of certain areas, it might be the God of this territory and the God of that territory, Nehemiah says, God, you're not a God of a territory. You're not a God of Jerusalem or just the nation of Israel. You're the God of heaven. You are the God who is over all the earth, who created all the universe. And you recognize that that God was great, big, massive, bigger than the problem that they were facing, bigger than the Persian army, bigger, bigger than the king of the Persians. And he says, you're awesome. I shared this last week. I use that term way too loosely. I say everything is awesome. I said it this morning. Somebody is t- sharing a story. I'm like, ah, oh, that's so awesome. Everything is awesome. But the word he's using here, speaking of God, it's literally you create fear in me because you are so big and I am so small in comparison. He had a humble and honest understanding of who God was in his character and his greatness and his immensity. He says, You are awesome. And he says, You are the covenant keeping God. When you say you do, you're going to do something, we can believe you're going to do it because you keep your promises. So he reflects upon the character of God before he even starts making requests. We build this foundation, this bottom line of understanding who God is. It's the same thing when Jesus taught us to pray. He said, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name that word hallowed means revered or holy or set apart it's not that my prayer makes god that he's already that my prayer reminds me that god is that by reflecting on the character of god i'm reminded of who he is before i begin even making a request and I believe, so often we talk about prayer and we say that prayer, it feels weird because some people will say, well, prayer is just a conversation with God. And I hear people say, well, that, it's hard because when I talk to you, there's back and forth. But when I talk to God, it's one-sided. But it's not. Prayer and study of God's Word go hand in hand. God has spoken most clearly to us through His Word. And as I study His Word, I respond to God in prayer. And as I study His Word, I find His character. As I dig into His Word, I find that He is good and holy and loving and forgiving and just and kind and patient. As I look at God through His Word, I see who He is. Now I know His character and I can reflect upon that. So often in the Old Testament, the men and women, who they would speak of God with different names. They might say, you are the God who sees me. Some of us are in a position right now where we think God is blind to what's going on in our lives. He's blind to what's going on in our world. He is the God who sees. He knows what's happening. They might say, you are the God who provides. I have a need, Lord. I I have something in my life that is lacking. You are the God who provides. You are the God who's a shelter or a rock. You are the God of peace. They would reflect upon His character using His name. That's the foundation we build upon in prayer. Who is God? And based on who He is, now I can approach Him in that prayer. Second, confess sins. What does it look like to pray like the walls are falling down? Reflect on the character of God. Confess sins. He goes on in verse 6. He says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. After reflecting upon the character of God, Nehemiah then reflects upon his own. And he confesses his sins to God. He recognizes in light of who you are, God, I have fallen short. Now, as I read through Nehemiah's account, he's a stand-up guy. He's a great leader. He has character. He's a man of prayer. I don't see flaws. But Nehemiah was smart enough to understand that he was not innocent in the eyes of a holy God. He recognized that, I love his terminology, he says, we have committed against you. 
My family and my father's family have sinned against you. He had an understanding that he, ha- he personally had fallen short of God's holiness. I love how Jesus' disciple John put it. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we, de- we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claimed we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. The truth is that we all have sinned. We all have fallen short of God's glory. In light of His character, His holiness, His justice, His righteousness, we miss the mark. John says if we act as if we don't have that, we deceive ourselves. And think about a parable that Jesus shared and really kind of attacking our measurements. He shared a story about a Pharisee and a tax collector, tax collector, a tax collector being somebody in their society that was deemed to be the worst of sinners. And the two of them entered the temple to pray and the Pharisee stood up in his prayers and said, God, I am so grateful that you have not made me like sinners. I'm so grateful that you have not made me like this tax collector because I tithe and I do this and I do that. And in his pious perception, he failed to see that he was a sinner in need of God's mercy. I love how Andrew Murray puts it in his book, Humility. He says, the Pharisee may take up the note of praise and in thanking God be congratulating himself. Pride can clothe itself in the garments of praise and penitence. In contrast, the tax collector stood in the back, couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven and he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said that tax collector left justified, not the Pharisee. Why? Because he understood his desperate need of mercy from a holy and just God because he did not meet the mark. It's important in our reflection of prayer that we confess our sins. But understand, guys, when we confess our sins, it doesn't mean we run from God. When I listen to what John wrote and understand God's character, he says if you, are, if you are faithful to confess your sins, what is He faithful to do? Forgive. That's His character. So I reflect on His character. And, and too often when we sin, we want to run from God as if he, he wants nothing to do with us. And when we should be running to Him the most, we're running away. And in my sin, I run to God and I hand it to Him and say, God, I confess this. And He and His character is faithful to forgive. So don't run from Him in the midst of this. You know, I love how Nehemiah prays. I, I know that there are so many in this room, so many listen at home, you pray for our nation. And that's a great thing. We should do that. But notice that Nehemiah doesn't pray for his, his nation as if he's a distinct ex, external part of that nation. He's a part of that nation when he prays for it. He says, we have sinned against you. Not they've sinned and I'm over here actually being righteous and living a good life. He says, we. Because our world is broken not because of God, but because of us. Our sin. After the world wars, there were individuals who had to comb the beaches to to get landmines out of the beaches. That's our life existence. It may not be my sin, but the sins of somebody else have put landmines in my life. And I had nothing to do with it sometimes. Sometimes I had everything to do with it. Sometimes I put landmines for other people to have to walk around. But that's our broken world. And we comb through it. And we live in the midst of it. But we can because Jesus did that for us. He stepped in to the landmines that he didn't create. He was innocent, righteous in the eyes of God, but he took our sin so that we could become his righteousness. It's important in our prayer. If we're going to pray like the walls are coming down, let's be honest about our own failures. Let's confess our sins as a nation, as, an, as individuals. And let's pray the promises of God. He goes on and says, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but if you return to me and obey my commands, 
Then, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Nehemiah focuses on God's promise. He understood that in their history, through the prophet Moses, God had made a covenant with his people. God has said to them, here's my commands. Keep them, and I will, I will keep you in this land, and I will bless you, and I will pour out more and more blessing on your life. Break them, and I will scatter you. That was a promise, a covenant that they entered into. It was different from the Abrahamic covenant. When God came to Abraham, God made Abraham a promise. I will bless you as a person, as a nation. I will multiply you. And in their culture, so often what they would do is they'd take an ox or some kind of animal and they'd split it in half. They would cut it in half. And then they would split the two parts of that animal. And the individuals making a covenant with each other would walk through those two parts almost as a statement to say, let this happen to me if I break the covenant. When God made the covenant with Abraham, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and God alone walked through the pieces because that promise was only dependent on God, not Abraham. No matter what Abraham did, God would keep that promise. With Israel in the Mosaic covenant, God collectively with them made the covenant. He said to them, you do this, I'll bless you, you don't, I'll scatter you. They said, we agree we'll do everything that you said to do. But they didn't. Because they didn't, they were scattered. And now they're in the land of the Persians. And Nehemiah is saying, I recognize that. You did what you said you would do. But you also promised that if we repent and return to you, you'll bring us back. That's what we're doing today. Nehemiah is saying, we're coming back. Keep your promises. And so his, his understanding was that God is a God who keeps His promises. He's covenant-keeping God, so I'm going to pray the promises of God. So often our prayers struggle because we pray things that God has not promised. God has not promised to make me wealthy. God has not promised to keep me healthy. God has not promised that I will have a good marriage. God has not promised that I'll never suffer. We pray things in comfort and desire. And then we, I see too often people walk away from the faith not because there was something that, oh, they didn't treat me right. Sometimes that happens. But so often people walk away from the faith because they were sold something that wasn't true. They were sold an idea that if you come to Jesus, He'll make your life better. And life didn't get better. It actually got harder. They faced persecution. They struggled. They were attacked spiritually. And so all of a sudden, the message of come to Jesus, your life will get better, it doesn't pan out. We say, I don't buy that Jesus stuff. Jesus didn't promise that. He said, all those who wish to live godly will suffer persecution. He said, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So he speaks of reality. What we need to claim are his promises. But here, we may not have been promised those things, but we have been promised a ton. I've been promised, and we dove into this a couple weeks back, and we're going to put it out on our website. We're going to put it out on social media, hopefully in the e-view, just a reminder of some of those things. But just a quick touch on some of those things. We are promised that God will be with us no matter what, what we go through. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. God has promised that He will work all things together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has promised that if I started a work in you, I will finish what I started. God has promised that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be in that place. God has promised us so much. And here's what we do as parents. because we, you, My parents, my grandparents, you recognize this. You've got to be cautious with what you say to your kids. Because they remember everything, don't they? If you say you're going to do something, it could be like eight months later and they're like, Daddy, you, so, you said we we're going to do this. They remember it. So we become cautious because too often we maybe don't really want to do what we said we were going to do or we fail. God is not cautious. He spills out promises because He knows He is a promise-keeping God. He's going to keep those promises. But I don't know those promises if I don't dig in God's Word. 
prayer and, a, and the study of God's Word go hand in hand. I speak His character because I see His character in His Word. I pray His promises because I read His promises in His Word. They go hand in hand. It's dialogue. Pray the promises of God. Fourth, pray for God's glory. Not your glory. Not what you desire. Not what you want. Pray for God's glory. Nehemiah goes on and says this, They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Notice the pronoun. All throughout his prayer, he speaks of them as servants. He speaks about God's name. His, his issue with the city being destroyed is the city was a declaration. Israel was a declaration of the name of God, so it being destroyed defamed the name of God. His desire was for God to have glory, and that's justified because God alone deserves glory. We pray too often for our comforts, for our own glory. Nehemiah prayed for the glory of God. Our prayers seek the glory of God. I shared this with our our young men and women on uh, Open Gym Monday night. There's a young man, I don't know how old he is at this point. His name is Nick Vujicic. I don't know if you ever heard about him. But Nick was born with no arms or legs. Born that way. And at the age of eight, you know, think about it. When you were young, maybe somebody made fun of your fat head, made fun of your big ears. Nick was made fun of. Think about how cruel we are as human beings, as children. Nick was made fun of because he had no limbs. When he was eight years old, he was contemplating suicide. It just struck me, my, my youngest is eight. Think about your child wanting to take their life at eight. He said he sat in a bathtub. He wanted to kill himself. He wanted to drown himself because somebody had to actually pick him up out of the tub. But he couldn't go through with it because he thought about how it would hurt his parents. So he struggled and he struggled and he struggled. And then at the age of 14, he read a story in John's Gospel, John chapter 9. At the beginning of the story, there's a man who was born blind. And the disciples ask a question of Jesus. In essence, it's the same question Nick had been asking all of his life. Why? The disciples ask, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or the sin of his parents? And Nick had been asking God for 14 years, why? Why did you allow me to be born without arms and legs? And here's how Jesus responds. Jesus says, neither... Neither this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And at that moment, Nick gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he recognized that God had started something in him that was going to impact people in a way he never imagined. Since then, Nick has been on, he's been in over 24 different countries. He's spoken to over 300 million people. And Nick will tell you, if I had arms and legs, I would not have had that exposure. People, they might listen to me, but not the same way they listen to me as a torso and a head sitting on a table. I encourage you, go check it out. You go home today, look it up on YouTube. The guy surfs, he skateboards, he swims. It's amazing. But he, rec- he came to a point where he realized that God was going to reveal His glory through him. I think about our, there's a young boy in our church, his name is Landon. And his legs are crippled and he can't walk. I just think about what God is going to do in his life. Where he's, he's, he's young and he's looking at his little siblings and saying, why can they run and play? And I can't. And I pray that he would see that God is working his glory in him. That God is going to use him in a way that would declare God's worth and God's glory that you and I never could. Seek the glory of God in your prayer. And then finally, be ready to be an answer to your own prayers. Nehemiah prays. And Nehemiah is not a prophet, he's not a priest, he's just a guy. He prays and he fasts and he weeps. 
He says this, Lord, let Your ear be attentive to the prayer of this Your servant and to the prayer of Your servants who delight in revering Your name. Give Your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. What is he talking about? Who's this man? When Nehemiah uses the terminology of servant, that's how he viewed himself. It's how he viewed the nation of Israel. And he says, give me favor in the presence of the man. The man he's speaking of is the king of Persia. He is about to go in and ask the king of Persia, can I go back and take a group and rebuild my city and rebuild the walls and reestablish things? He's going to ask him. He is ready to be an answer to his own prayers. And then he makes this statement, and I was the cupbearer to the king. He doesn't say, I was was a priest. He doesn't say, I was a prophet. Now understand, his role is not insignificant. It's very significant. He's the guy who protects the king. He's the guy who drinks the, the king's drink before he does to make sure it's not poison. So if he dies, everybody knows, okay, the king's gonna die. Let's not drink it. So that's a really important role. And as a foreigner to come into this land and him have so so much character that the king would say, I want that guy to be the person who protects me. We know historically that in time the cupbearer would become sort of like an advisor to the king. So it's not an insignificant role. It's an important role. But the task he's about to take on is one of construction and spiritual leadership. He doesn't say... And and I wanted to give favor with the king to go do this thing, and I was a foreman. And I was a a mason. He says, I was a cupbearer. Because he understood that it didn't matter the role that he had. It mattered whether he was willing to respond if God had asked him to respond to the need. So many times we're praying, and God might be stirring in us and saying, yeah, I, I, I want to answer that prayer and you're the answer. I want to use you. I just wonder, I dream what would be true of our church if we prayed like the walls were falling down and we were willing to be the answer to our own prayer, what could be said? There would be stories of, I fostered all of these children throughout my life and I was a massage therapist. I helped those who are struggling with substance abuse, and I was a contractor. I provided food for kids who didn't have food, and I was a truck driver. I mean, think about the the, the possibilities are endless. It doesn't matter my work, it's my willingness. But as I pray for God to do something amazing, guys, I don't know if the walls are falling down. I don't. But I want to pray like they are. I want to have the same heart and passion that Nehemiah had that brought him to weep. That he looked at brokenness and didn't Facebook quote stuff and didn't throw stuff at other people. He just said, I'm going to get on my knees and weep and pray for my nation. To pray like the walls are falling down. I invite you guys to join me and to be ready to be the answer to your own prayer. It doesn't matter your work. God might use you to say, I wrote curriculum for people to be trained and built up and I was a stay-at-home mom. It's not about our work, it's about our willingness to respond to whatever God might call us to do as servants of Him to answer the prayer, the great prayer that we pray. Would you join me? God, You are great and awesome. You are bigger than our nation. You are bigger than this world. You are bigger than viruses. You are bigger than all of the struggles that we see, Lord. I pray that we would reflect upon Your character to know that when it feels like our world is falling apart, You are not. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not change. Father, You are an awesome covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God, when you tell us you are going to do something, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to do it. When you told us that you will save us, you not only said that, you sealed us with your Holy Spirit, guaranteeing the inheritance that is ours in heaven. 
Father, we confess collectively that we have sinned against You. We confess that we have fallen short of Your holiness and righteousness, but we thank You that in Your great promise, You sent the Messiah, Your Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for those sins. And I pray if there's somebody here or somebody listening at home that they have never come to understand that or believe that, that today would be the day they would repent, turn away from their sins, and believe in Your Son, Jesus Christ, for eternal life and righteousness. Father, we seek Your glory as a church and as individuals, that it would not be our names that are known. It will not be the name of CEFC that is known. That it will be the name of Jesus Christ that is displayed in everything that we do, whatever that may be. It's not a matter of our work. God, I don't stand here in any greater significance because of my role. There are people in this room who, I, who, will, who will have impact that I could never have. Lord, I pray that there would be stories within our community and within our church of ways that you moved and worked and we say, you know what, I was just a truck driver, I was just a farmer, I was just a mason, I was just whatever. But I served and was willing to be an answer to, to the prayers that I brought to God. Lord, you're the one who brings down the walls that need to come down. And you are the fortress and wall that we need when it feels like everything around us is falling down. We trust you and ask that you will empower us to be men and women of prayer. Men and women ready to serve as an answer to our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.